Um, and yeah, I'm probably uh, best known for being the founder CEO of Blue Cadet. And I'll quickly tell you a little bit about Blue Cadet. So um, Blue Cadet is a digital experience agency that engages audience through knowledge, empathy, and action. Let's get into a little bit more detail there. Um, so we have two studios. Uh, we have our main studio who's here in uh, Philly, in Fishtown. Open studio tonight, uh, Design Philly, come by. Um, and then we also have a small studio up in New York. Um, but Blue Cadet is really, uh, it's not me, it's a lot of other people. There's about 50 of us, uh, designers, strategists, project managers, developers, uh, a really wonderful collaborative team that kind of gets a lot of this stuff done. Um, so anything that you see on our site that you're like, wow, Josh is talented, no, that's these guys. Um, and, and these are some of the different types of products that we do. Um, so we do these really uh, beautiful uh, websites. Check out the new whiy.org, which was launched this week. Um, and but we also do a lot of uh, we do we do apps we do a lot of uh, work in in galleries and museums in physical spaces uh, we've done uh, games uh, and we do it entirely in the cultural sector so this is you know museums uh, cultural organizations large nonprofits higher ed. And occasionally some brand stuff, but not really, not very, very seldom. Um, and you know, I, I as Erica mentioned, I, I used to host Creative Mornings for a while, and I kind of know that the worst possible thing I could do is take you through a giant portfolio review, um, only second to like actually like bringing you deeply into my childhood, um, which was lovely, which was totally lovely. Um, but um, I, I, I think I just wanted to like give you guys sort of a sense of like, okay, you know, I started out, I was like a guy. Um, with a modicum of skill, how do you go from that to like actually like running an agency? Like how do you how do you kind of make that leap? Um, so and I, I didn't exactly know where to start, so I wanted to start in the year 2000. So the year 2000 is basically when I graduated from college, and I was a English fine arts major, which meant I was like basically unemployable. Um, not only that, but I actually like I, I sort of likened myself as like someone who you know identified with in, like creatively. Um, you know, I read a lot. I was really into like design, I, well, I was really into art, um, but I didn't know anything about the creative community, I didn't know about design, like this was like, the internet sucked back then, if anyone remembers, uh, really, there really wasn't that much happening, um, you know, this was like pre-Friendster, um, and you know, frankly, like I just didn't, I, I didn't really know what the hell I wanted to do, um, so I graduated, and I basically, um, what I had was a bunch of like pen and ink drawings, and, and I took these around to different ad agencies in New York um, because I was like, this is like a creative place, and I am a creative person. And like in in retrospect, it's mortifying. Um, but it, but but I also have to say, whenever I'm like at a portfolio review uh, or something like that, and like someone shows me like um, some class project that like you know depicts their childhood, and I'm like, and they're like, this is design. I'm like, I, it's not, but I, I feel you. I feel you. I totally feel you. Um, so what would happen is. I would go around to New York and I would go to these, you know, these sort of mortifying interviews and they would just like look at me and be like, you don't, really? Um, and then I would go to like museums afterwards. So I'd go to a bunch of art museums and then I got bored one day and I was like, I'm just sick of art museums. So I went to the American Museum of Natural History and I saw these like kiosks. Um, and I was like, wow, that's really cool. Uh, that's that, like I actually had played around with some like uh, macromedia director and flash four um, Like so I kind of knew how these things were built I was like, okay, that's what I want to do and I was like I didn't know that agencies existed um, So I was like this must have been done by a museum. So I went on monster.com not a plug I've not been on there since um, and I, I, I looked I looked it up and I and I found a job uh, that, that fit the bill and it was at the Smithsonian American Art Museum for a new media specialist and the my boss there who became my boss spoiler um, you know he likened himself an artist so he was very impressed with these pen and ink drawings um, so basically in around like 2002 I was like you know heavily ensconced in the Smithsonian um, and I was like kind of like learning the ropes figuring it out and like this was a time when they were doing all these like online exhibits um, so like this was like a thing like these like little flash stories that were going up and everyone was like these are amazing and there was like I, I was like following second story and terror incognita and I was kind of getting a sense what was out there and like all I wanted to do was create one of these things so in like 2002 I kind of got my chance um, 
So the, the first real project um, that I got to really kind of dig my teeth into was for this project about this guy, George Catlin. Um, so George Catlin, um, coincidentally, uh, grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Uh, he uh, uh, was also trained as a lawyer, and then with you know, very little talent, actually decided that he wanted to become an artist, and he became really obsessed with the American Indians, um, and particularly the American Indians on the plains. Um, he's, you know, he's not regarded as like a great craftsman, but like, his stuff is really important, because he, he was convinced that the American Indians were basically going to be eradicated, um, and he was going to go and like, basically paint them before they got wiped out. Um, and and he's very, very controversial. He was a little bit of a carny. It's a totally interesting story. Grab me later, I'll tell you. Um, but but he's, he's held in some mixed regard. Um, so I convinced basically the Smithsonian that they needed to do an online exhibit about this. And this would be like so cool. And um, they, should go, that they should send me out on the road to go to all these places that uh, Catlin had traveled and talk to people who were in the American Indian community, um, the people who, who could have some different sort of uh, vantages on, on his life and legacy. And we would create this exhibit. And like, they, thought it. I don't know why. Um, you know, because like, I mean, honestly, I wasn't pay being paid that much. And I'm like, I was like willing to like hang out in Oklahoma for like long stretches of time. So, so basically, it was me and this 62 uh, year old woman who became like my best friend that year. Um, and we just like traveled around to like North, you know, North Dakota, Oklahoma, New Mexico. Um, and we were collecting all these interviews and putting together the story. Um, and this is what it became. Um, so this is Catlin's Campfire Stories. Um, so this is terrible, you know, like from a, like from a design and UI perspective. Um, for, forgive me. Um, I was learning. Um, but, it, but it was like, you know, I also just like had to learn it all as I was going. You know, I had to basically teach myself Flash in real time to pull this thing off. Uh, there was a, it was a radial spinner. The thing about the Smithsonian is this is actually still live, which is actually crazy. Um, like you could totally go home and enjoy. Um, you know, like dig in. Um, but was but was amazing is so like but first time it was like pretty good and it ended up winning a a gold muse award which was like the big award in the museum community so I was like so stoked um, I was like I came back to the office and I was like I'm ready okay I did it guys what's next and they're like all right Josh congratulations you did a wonderful job um, go back to your desk and do tutorials we'll have another project for you in like six years or six months a year I'm like okay great okay great um, so I had a beautiful no cubicle you know this nice even fluorescent lighting and um, I started getting these medical symptoms um, and I was like I'm diabetic um, like, like, no, I'm not. Um, but basically, what, like, I, I was like, I was, I started like just being like lightheaded all the time. I'm a little lightheaded now, honestly. Um, but like, you know, basically, what was happening was like, I, I, you know, I went, started going to these doctors. I got an echocardiogram. I got tested for all these allergies. I did a tilt table test, which is basically they put you on a table, they tilt you, and they just wait and see how long it takes to, for you to pass out. Um, and then finally, like, you know, after after going through these rounds, I ended up like basically um, sitting. Sitting across from this Israeli therapist named Adi Shmuley. That's a wonderful name, wonderful man. Um, and he's like, dude, guy, you're like this young guy, you know, you had this wonderful adventure, and now you're sitting in a cube like a bureaucrat. Get the hell out. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, I will. Um, and, and so basically, <laughs> I, I would like to say that, like, I was like, yes, this is my trumpet moment. I'm excited. I'm going to, like, you know, chart. But I was, like, so sad. Like, I was so sad to leave the Smithsonian. They had, like, all these amazing stories. Like, their collection's unbelievable. Like, you, I could spend my life just, like, going around and telling the stories of all the things that were there. And I was just, it was, it crushed me to leave. But I left, you know? And then for the next few years, um, I, uh, I kind of freelanced. Okay, so this is also the this. So people are like, you know, how do you build a studio? And this is the other question everyone asks me: What the hell does Blue Cadet th Blue Cadet mean? Let's see. I'm just gonna let it go. I, 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 was, I was gonna give you like 20 seconds. I'm just, I'm, I'm just too into it. Uh, 
Anyway, um, so basically, uh, like, Blue Cadet was like this Modest Mouse song. Um, so at the time, like, Modest Mouse was like super obscure, so I was like, no, I don't know about these guys. Uh, this was like their first LP. Um, I, I'd registered the name, but like, I was just like desperate for connection, honestly, because um, I was like in this super alienated phase. Um, but, you know, so for the next couple years, I just sort of like was going around and I was just like doing the hustle. You know, I was doing banner ads, I was like a freelance flash guy. Um, I was working, I did some work for the Holocaust Museum, for the, for the Museum of the American Indian, uh, which was like semi meaningful, but it was mostly like a hired gun. Um, and, you know, I was working for a lot of ad agencies. So I, I uh, in 2006, um, I was actually, I had been cast as a hip, hipster nerd. Uh, this was pre-hipster, but essentially that's what they, they cast me as, who was super into AMD microchips. Um, and I was being photographed you know, in the scene with my friend Raj, who apparently, the, the, the premise is that we went around in this road trip to like, discover what was so amazing about the new AMD microchips. Um, which, but they paid me really well, and it was like, kind of fun. Um, and I, afterwards, I you know, uh, went out for drinks with the photographers, uh, David Lee and Josh Kogan. And we we're you know, like sitting there drinking in this basement bar, um, and this was actually right when Hurricane Katrina was happening. And there, there was all this footage, and so Josh Kogan, who became, you know, honestly, one of my like, dearest, closest friends, um, he and I can go off on this stuff. He's a trained anthropologist, and like, he's just super, super, like, he, he'll go there with me. So like, we just start riffing about, like, oh my god, like, can you imagine what this means to like, these people who are like, you know, separated from their homes? And, like, and we're like, can you imagine what it's like to be like, a high school student? You know, like a high school student where there's like all these like rituals of like, um, you know, prom, yearbook, you know, like all this like kind of like stuff where, you know, like your senior year is like really this ritual of kind of like bonding a community together uh, before you're sort of like separated out. And I was like, could you imagine what it's like for these kids, you know, to like, to like, to be in this situation where they're really kind of like in this diaspora and they're sort of spread out. They're not, they're going to miss all this opportunity. And we're like, and we just kind of got really, we started thinking about it, I'm thinking about it. And um, you know, the next morning, I, I, I was still thinking about it, so I went and did some research, and there was one school that was reopening, it was Benjamin Franklin High School. I reached out to the principal and I said, well, I'm gonna do, we're do, we want to do an interactive documentary um, about your school and about the students, you know, some of whom were returning, some of whom weren't. Um, and then that, that ended up becoming a uh, yearbook. Uh, I forget what my next slide looks like. Oh, no, no too, too soon. Um, but uh, so what happened was like when we when we got down there, um, we you know we got there before school started. And we started going around, and there was just like this weird, crazy apocalyptic scene. Um, you know, we went down to the ninth ward before they cleared it out. There was literally a giant uh, tanker sitting in the in the middle of a neighborhood, like a giant ship. Um, we went to another neighborhood where literally we saw houses stacked on other houses. Um, you know, there was like it was it was unbelievably. Crazy, and like we we had planned to stay down there for a while. There was no power uh, for most of the city. Uh, we were in this one hostel where they like literally just run like power cords down the street to power it, um, like for blocks. Um, and we we're like, we got to get out of here. This is crazy. Like well, this is this is wrong. But then we we're like, you know what? We should meet the students. We should start talking to them. See see like see you know we we said we would do this. So then we started talking to these kids. And you know, as we started talking to them, we're like, oh my god, like we really have like an obligation to kind of like tell their story. Um, you know, they were there, and so this is actually just a little video of uh, one of the that came from one of these interviews. Oops, sorry. Once upon a time, there were three girls, and their names were Kate, Kaisha, and Charlotte. One day, they went to a haunted house. In the house lived Count Dracula, the, witch, the Wicked Witch, Mr. Bones, and upstairs was Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. Nobody knew that there were, there was screaming ghosts in the house. The Wicked Witch was on her way to Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. On the way, she met Mr. Bones. Then she met Count Dracula on her way up the stairs. Then she got to Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. When she opened the door, there were some bats. When she met Dr. Frankenstein, they talked for a long time. Then she went home and went to sleep. <laughs> it's probably like a bunch of stories. Oh, look. Oh, Christmas. A recipe for a perfect Christmas. Fireplace, home with Christmas tree. Love and caring. Two large candles, five cups, memories. Um, so this is ultimately what uh, the yearbook project looked like. 
And you know, it was, there were a lot of things that came out of it. So like one thing you might be looking at and you're like, wow, Josh, you got to be a much better designer between uh, <laughs> Catlin and Yearbook. And, and the reason for that, um, which was, and what was actually a really important observation, was I was about maybe three quarters of the way through the project. And meanwhile, like know that we were like fairly unpaid for any of this. We got like a very small grant, um, ultimately. Um, but I was just like, I'm not good enough as a designer to pull this off. I kept, you know, trying and trying and pushing, and and I was just like, I wasn't. It was good, and it was good enough in some ways, but it wasn't good. It, it, it wasn't to the standard that I wanted. So I pulled a designer that I knew from doing some work with the Holocaust Museum, and you know, she she helped me push it through. And and through this, I learned a couple things. Um, one, uh, I didn't want to be limited by my own talents. Um, I just really wanted the work to be great. I wanted to do right by the content, by the work. And two, I also enjoyed um, kind of helping other people's talents manifest um, and, and guiding a process more than I like doing everything myself. Um, so at this point, I was 30 years old and I moved back to Philly. Um, I was like, okay, if I'm going to like do this thing, if I'm going to have a staff, I'm, if I'm going to make, uh, you know, if I'm going to actually build a studio. Um, I, I grew up outside of Philly. I was like, Philly has amazing talent. They're, Philly has amazing talent. You guys are amazing. Um, like I knew all the, I, I mean honestly sometimes I, I was just like look, Blue Kid is basically predicated on keeping the talent in Philadelphia from moving to Brooklyn. Like that's not, that, that was like, that was basically my whole initial business plan. I was like, I know they're all going to Dumbo, I'm going to get in their way, I'm going to give them an option. Um, and we're going to build something awesome here. Um, and then sort of, um, you know, this is a bit of a leap, you know, like so it's been 10 years now. And you know, I would say that, you know, if you look at Blue Cadet, uh, you know, it's, it really is about the team, it's about you know, the work that they produce, but I think a lot of the, the work um, still has a lot of the DNA and then sort of the intention that came from those early things in Catlin yearbook. Um, but I wanted to take you a little bit up to date uh, to uh, 2016, which is a, to, to a more contemporary project that we did, uh, to kind of illustrate this a little bit. So um, in 2016, we were asked to do a show for the Art Institute of Chicago um, around Van Gogh's bedrooms. And what's interesting is, you know, they, these three bedrooms were being brought together for the first time. And so the, the thing about Van Gogh is, like, Van Gogh is not Catlin. Like, Van Gogh is actually, like, a beautiful, beautiful painter. Um, like, like they're, really, they're really evocative. But, like, in some ways, the beauty is almost a little distracting. Um, and, like, also, like, the way that we understand his story is a little cliche. Like, oh, he's, like, this crazy guy. He cut his ear off. Uh -huh. um, like, but, like, do you relate? But, like, I don't know if, like, people relate that. Um, he was a really crazy guy. Like, you know, he's not dissimilar from some of the people that you'd see, you know, on a street corner in Philadelphia. Like, he was deeply troubled. And what was interesting about these paintings, um, aside from their beauty, is that, you know, basically he'd been like a kind of an itinerant. He'd been kind of a homeless guy. You know, he'd been, he'd been crashing, um, on, you know, at Theo's house, his brother, um, you know, but he'd been traveling around. And essentially, um, you know, he's lost. And, he, you know, he finally found himself this beautiful town of Arles, and he finally had a bedroom. You know, he had a place, and he was like so excited about it. And he was writing these letters to his brother, and he was so excited that he like finally found like sort of like safe passage in the storm. You know, he was feeling great. Um, he had this idea that you know, so here's here's his room. This room over here leads to where Gauguin uh, was actually going to stay. So Gauguin was a friend of his, and they were going to be roommates, and they were going to create art together. And it fell apart really quickly uh, because, uh, among other things, Van Gogh is a terrible roommate. Because, uh, like, I mean, if you've ever, if you've ever uh, had a roommate that has, like, deep mental issues, um, it, was, it was very much like that. Um, and, and, you know, and then shortly after this, he would be institutionalized, and he would, and he would then commit suicide and die. Um, but we wanted, we had this amazing source material, and we wanted to tell the story. You know, we wanted, we, th we thought that these things just being hung, beautifully lit with, like, tombstone labels, with, like, you know, a, a, a doctorate having written hundreds of words about it wouldn't be enough. Um, and, the, and the museum obviously thought so too, or they wouldn't have paid us. Um, so this is kind of what was created. So we, we did a few other pieces for them too, but, but again, like this is what we were trying to, there was some intentionality behind this. Um, and so now I kind of wanted to take you guys, you know, out of sort of the conceptual a little bit more into the practical.
We managed to go from doing, you know, like microsites, you know, to doing a range of these different types of products and things, you know, and obviously a lot of this has to do with like building a team and, and, uh, and, and building our capabilities and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long sort of pivoting road. Um, but I wanted to take you through a little bit of how, how I think about these things. This is sort of like the Venn diagram of Blue Cadet. So, you know, we have like amazing content, viable budget, and moves the studio forward. A lot of times we'll spend most of our time in this sort of space, which is like, it's a viable budget, it has amazing content, and maybe it moves the studio forward, but in a kind of an iterative way. This here is amazing content, moves the studio forward, but there's the budget, it might not be that viable. This is where there's risk, and this is where there's opportunity, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then sometimes, you know, you sit there and you say, okay, well, you know, we, we have to stay pretty true to, to like who we are. You know, this is very intentional, this amazing content thing. If we sort of neglect that, you sort of lose a lot of the, the heart and the core of the, what makes the studio uh, unique and you lose the culture. Um, and this is a different way of looking at it. You know, so here's like high opportunity, no opportunity, low potential profit, high potential profit. Up here again is like that sort of like, you know, the unicorn land. You know, like this is like where we would love to be. I mean, we, and I, I think like from the outside, it totally seems like we're there all the time. And you're like, you look at it and like, oh, wow, Blue Kid gets all this like great work. Or maybe you don't say that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't know what you think. Um, but, but like, I, I think we get great work. This right here, low potential profit, um, high opportunity. Uh, we've done a bunch of these. Um, here's the thing. Like this right here, we did one a couple years ago. Um, where we just, it was an amazing opportunity. Um, it almost put the studio out of business. Because um, like low potential profit is actually a little bit of a nice way of putting it. Because it could also be catastrophic loss. Um, and then this right here, you know, I call this like the gilded cage. You know, no opportunity, high potential profit. And like I meet a lot of people who are like creatives that just like find themselves here. You know, they're like, they want to be up here. But they're like here and like, oh, we'll start like a labs department. They're like, eh, and then they're back here. And like honestly, I pass no judgment. You know, I, like sometimes I'm like, I wish I could just be a person that like lives here all the time. This right here is just stupid. Um, <laughs> you, you, like, if you find yourself here, you like work on your systems, get some post-it notes, figure some things out, you're, you're, you're doing something wrong. And then right here is actually a lot of what, what I've been trying to explore recently, which is like we've been doing a lot of strategy projects and we'll try to engage them in like sort of a, we're like, okay, don't pay us everything up front. Just give us a little bit of money. Let's feel it out a little bit. And this sort of allows us to like sometimes move things that would be here over here or here or here. I kind of promised you like a little bit of a map, you know, like how do you get there? You know, like, okay, I'm sitting here with my, you know, my, my desk and my computer and my software. How do you build a studio? And I, and I would just say there really isn't a map. I think the, the trick is really to kind of keep your eyes open, like see, seek opportunities, execute really, really well, um, and then you know, really find your own path. And you know, I, I believe you guys can, so thank you.